RPV City Talk is brought to you by the City of Rancho Palos Verdes to inform the community on recent city matters. RPV City Talk is a weekly show that features the RPV Mayor, City Council, or City Employees. Hi everyone, I'm Liz Brown Swanson and welcome to RPV City Talk. It's always great to be sitting in the council chambers at Hess Park with our great mayor of RPV, Mayor Ken Dida. Thank you for joining us once again for the monthly update of all that's happening in the city. My pleasure. Plus some. It's always great to have you. We're always, it's very busy right now in the city. Number one priority is safety. Let's talk about crime prevention efforts and bring us up to speed on just what the city's doing in terms of with the Sheriff's Department. And in fact, you've just you know, approved the next uh, Sheriff's contract, so to speak. So tell us all about that. Okay, what we've done is we've added additional deputies uh, strictly for our city. Uh, we put them in the preserve in lieu of a ranger. Uh, they're more effect they will be more effective because they're sworn officers, but at the same time, in an emergency, they're also available. So that's gonna be a great improvement and hopefully people will get the message that the preserve is something to preserve, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, we've increased the enforcement on the switchbacks because we had the problem with uh, racing there. And I think the people are beginning to get the message that uh, that's not what you do in a residential community. So, and I've had some calls from people there saying it has changed and they're very pleased. Uh, the new thing that's gonna come up right after the end of this fiscal year, that's, and that'll be the end of June, so July, they're gonna be putting up the automatic license plate reading cameras. Now, this is not to look at the people. It's basically looking at the license plates. And as soon as the license plate is identified, it goes against the database to see if there's a warrant out against that. So it's just another tool to keep track of people uh, that may have uh, some nefarious bent to them. Uh, so those three things are going on now. The ALPRs, it, this is, it's really very, very good because we have all four cities cooperating. Even though PV Estates has its own police department, they've joined with us and because we really are a peninsula community. So that's happening. Right, and there'll be a, dozens of cameras sort of around the outskirts of the entire peninsula that will be kind of the eyes too to see who's driving around and if, if there's- There will be there was 16 or 17 cameras at all the entrances to the peninsula with the exception of the same identical coverage at Western Avenue. Uh, Western Avenue intersections entering to the community there alone are some 17 entrances. So we're putting up two and we're gonna have a portable one in a sheriff's car. And what we're looking at is to see how effective that is, get some information. And in phase two, we're probably gonna take another look at that because uh, they're part of our community. Right. You've really stepped up uh, resources uh, with the Sheriff's Department. I think the overall contract is about $5.4 million. So um, if you include everything, it's actually more than more that. More than that. And, you know, obviously you were on the very first council, first mayor, and things have changed since back then. And we still like to think of ourselves as being so safe on the peninsula, but you've needed to do this because we saw an uptick in burglaries. The good news is they're starting to go down again, but. Yes, they've come down quite a bit. Uh, and it's due to enforcement and hopefully with what we're doing with extra deputies and with the ALPRs, it'll come down even further. The goal is to get back to the kind of community had in 73. All right, I'm there with you. Um, you mentioned earlier about just to kind of let the residents who might not have been aware of what's going on that don't on the east side of the hill with those switchbacks. Um, if you come down PB Drive East, talk about what residents came to the council because they were concerned about you know safety issues with you know, motorcycles and whatnot, just racing down the switchback. So how, how are, what's being addressed is gonna help it? Okay. How it's being addressed. Basically, uh, a lot of the social media is being used to inform people that we're gonna enforce it rather strictly. We have increased the enforcement there. By the way, uh, there's a sign that says zero tolerance. That there's, yeah, we got zero tolerance there. It, it's not, you know, if, if, it's, if the speed limit is 35 miles an hour, 36 doesn't cut it. Right. It's going to be zero tolerance uh, for all of that, racing and that sort of thing, because it became a venue where especially motorcyclists enjoyed going 
around the switchbacks and, and racing up and down. And it's and noisy. And creating a hazard. And noisy. <laughs> it was noisy. It's creating a hazard. There have been a lot of near misses with mm -hmm. bicyclists and cars. Uh, and before it gets to the point where somebody really uh, gets killed there, we wanted to put a stop to it. So that's going on right now, the enforcement. That's good. It's good to know yes. that they're, they're addressing that. Um, so in the area of public safety, anything else you want residents to be aware of? I know you're, you know, you're constantly um, addressing what's happening with public those, safety. Those are the things we've done for now. We're looking at some information like the ALPRs. Uh, it's not a closed issue. Uh, safety is something we review frequently. I sit on the regional law committee uh, and we're always concerned as a community. Mm -hmm about that. And we now have a new captain, Dan Berenger, who's now coming to council meetings, so he yes. is tapped in. Yes, uh, we're very happy that he's coming to council meetings uh, because he gets to understand some of the nuances of what we're talking about rather than just getting a cryptic report afterwards. Plus, he's here to answer a lot of questions and give us some input as to what can be done. So it's very good. Uh, he's a local one. Mm -hmm. He was brought up in RPV uh, on Golden Meadow. There you go. So, so he's uh, home. Uh, he's, he's got some affinity for the area, so that, that's great. Uh, Bolin was good. Uh, Behringer, I think, is going to be probably a little better because he's got more affinity for their area. Right, it helps when you're tied so in like it's that. It's a good thing. Public safety, obviously, top um, concern. And also, moving on, infrastructure and storm drains. We're going to move on to that. You have um, the storm drain uh, user fee is sunsetting, and the yes. council took a look at possibly revising it and putting it back out to the voters. You've decided not to do that at this time. Explain all, what all that okay. means. One, it is sunsetting. There is some uh, funds left on the order of about $2 million, so that's going to be continue to be used for the project. But when you look at water quality and flood control, it's a much bigger issue. And even though we had the storm drain user fee, the cost for the ordinance that was written, water quality and flood control, cost last year was $44 million. Uh, we're budgeting pretty much a like amount for the next 10 years. So the first 10 years took 44, the next 10 years we're looking at about 44 or 45 again. And we're very fortunate that we do have uh, the income without the extra taxes to be able to afford that. So we're pursuing that as vigorously as we did before. So how does that impact future projects? You're just going to go to the... It, it doesn't because it, it's just coming out of the capital improvement program. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, fun, much... the funding is there. The, the projects are still going to be done on a priority basis to complete all the storm drain maintenance and repair. That's going to continue. How much was coming in from that, that fee? About 1.3 million a year. So 13 million out of the 44 was a uh, storm drain user fee. So is, is it something you think is table for good or you might see it come back up again in a different way? Because I know that... 10 years is a long time. That there, it was collected there, for 10 years. Yeah, yeah. There, there is no real attempt to, to do it now, but if something happens to our income or something major happens that goes beyond what we have in a reserve, we'll have to consider mm -hmm. some other funding method then. Okay. However, if we do, uh, there are going to be two alternatives. If we go to the storm drain user fee, it's going to be a much tighter ordinance, so it, accountability is going to be a lot easier for people to understand. Or the other alternative is a parcel tax for the entire city, and that's what the council in the future is going to have to wrestle with. Right. Okay. Since we're talking about uh, dollars, it's budget season. How's that coming uh, yes. together? Describe the budget process to the residents and just how things are shaping up and just the challenges of really putting it together. Well, the big challenge is for the staff. They've got to do <laughs> yeah. all the work. But we've always asked staff to come up with a balanced budget, Okay. And that means we don't spend all the money because the council has established a reserve that it needs to keep for emergencies. Uh, you know, the Western Avenue sinkhole, you know, nobody expected that. So you've got to have a rainy day fund. Uh, and you use it when necessary and you replenish it over time again. But uh, the budget process has changed somewhat. And in my opinion, for the better. 
we're now getting specific dollars for all of the specific items instead of a broad brush type of thing. We're also being uh, given the information as to what funding is being used. So it's not just so many dollars and don't worry where it's coming from. Now we know where it's coming from. So it's, it's a much better process. It gives- That's true, we have a new uh, finance director, yes. Deborah Cullen, who is on it. <laughs> well, Deborah and Doug, Doug and Deborah City collaborated on this to bring this about. And the council has had a preview of it. And for the most part, it's gotten very favorable reviews from the council Excellent. because we now have definitive information. We can make truly informed decisions of how we spend the taxpayers' dollars. So explain where the city gets most of its revenues from and sort of what is the most that we're spending on what are our big expenses? Well, that's... I know you had a pie chart out there. I don't know yeah, that <laughs> okay. Uh, most of it comes from property tax and uh, associated taxes that go along with property. That's where most of it comes from, about oh, almost 50%. A big chunk is the transient occupancy tax. That alone brings in over $5 million. Thank you, okay. Taranea. Yes, thank you, Taranea, and I'm glad it's there because it's something they, the founders of the city talked about for a long, long time. And we finally got someone who would work with the city and put in a beautiful system rather than saying, since you want it, we're gonna do what we want. We rejected those, fortunately. Those are the two big things, okay? Sales tax comes in with some, and then we get uh, other uh, income from other sources uh, to make up the whole 100% of the income. But the two major ones, the biggest one is property tax. Even though our property tax is very low uh, compared to a lot of other cities, uh, but then our expenditures are carefully guarded too, so mm -hmm. we can b get by on it very nicely. So what are some of the biggest expenditures in the city? Okay, the two biggest ones basically are public safety, the sheriff's department, and the next one is personnel. Mm -hmm. Okay, those are the two big ones out of the general fund. Then the CIP, the Capital Improvement Program, which takes care of all the infrastructure, streets, it'll be part of the storm drain, uh, curbs, sidewalks, uh, landscape maintenance, that's the third biggest one. After that, they start diminishing. Speaking of that, I happen to, as you drive down Hawthorne Boulevard, you see they're putting in some trees as part yes. of the Hawthorne Beautification Project that's shaping up nicely. It's going to look great. It, it's, it's a beginning. It's, it's not going to be the end because I, I still don't like that cement in between. Fortunately, no, it's very it was, cracked. I was on standing It was there. painted green and looked uglier. Plain cement looks a lot better than this phony green painted stuff. Right. So, but, you know, again, it's uh, what we can do with the budget we have. Uh, we, we don't just put projects on and, and spend money willy-nilly. Uh, one of the things that I'm putting on the uh, agenda for the budget is public-private cooperation. Uh, years ago, when we had a uh, recycle fee we were collecting, some of that money was used to homeowners to imbue their entrances, okay? And we paid part and the homeowners paid part. So it was a combination event. Uh, it came a time when uh, the logic was since everybody isn't benefiting, all homeowners aren't doing it, it should go to the city. So they've decided to take that money and reduce the trash fee by okay. the amount, okay? So now everybody benefits $4, whatever it is right. per month. Uh, wasn't it it's about a, it's a quarter a, of a million dollars that kind of was available for beautification projects yeah, to homeowners groups? Yeah. So, so or, and I've had conversations with a number of, of groups of people, homeowners, uh, associations, and, and informal groups, that uh, saying, you know, how can we cooperate with the city to beautify it, okay? So we're going to be proposing putting aside, I'm going to be proposing putting aside a small amount of budget, as a 50-50 share for people who would want to share. Public-private partnership. Public-private partnership to now beautify arterials, not just the, the residential streets. You know, uh, adopt the street, yep. adopt Crest Road, adopt Hawthorne, adopt the street. And uh, there seems to be a, a, some 
good vibes about that. P people are saying, yeah. We yeah, can rethink we, it. We, and... we, we would like that, you know, work with the city because it helps our community. So right. it, it, it's heartening to see people willing to do that. And I hope the council includes that in their upcoming budget. Okay, well, stay tuned for that. Anything yes. else you want to let residents know? And, of course, go on the city website, rpvca.gov, oh, yeah. and you can click on it, and there's financial information of... Could spend all day taking a look at what's going. You could even see what checks you were written, writing out of the city. We we have gotten to the point where we are really totally transparent. We no longer have an opaque glass or translucent glass. We've removed the glass mm -hmm. so people can see all of that. And that was very important to you, and you've pushed and pushed. So I'm glad that you're, you're yeah, good, I, I pushed. You're satisfied with where the city's at now. Yes. Uh, oh. Three or four years ago, I pushed for the uh, compensation for employees to be done that way. Uh, the spreadsheet that I developed is, with slight modifications has been adopted. And it's on the city website. And there's no confusion because people said, well, this employee is getting that much. No, this much. No, that much. And people really didn't know. It's there now. You can tell what they get in salary, what they get in benefits, and what the total cost is per employee. Now, it's done by classification. Uh, we don't want to put uh, employees' names right. there. Uh, th that would be unseemly. Mm -hmm. But now you know, this classification is getting that kind of compensation. You even know what the council is getting. Right. So, you know. Uh, You're you almost volunteers, but you get, you get health benefits if you want them and things like yeah, that. Yeah, you can get health benefits, stipends. which are expensive if you want them. Uh, but you do get a stipend uh, to cover the expenses of running around. If you go on a long trip, then it's an expense report. Mm -hmm. But you get a small stipend for the stuff you do running around the community, you know, answering questions and doing that sort of thing. So that's there. Uh, and if you if you don't take the insurance, so that, that's all you get. Right. And, and it's a mere of four hundred dollars a year. I mean, a month. So it's it, you, you know, it's not an income to speak of. It's just supposed to cover incidentals. So back to the budget. You'll pass it the month during the month of June. That's standard. This, the the thirty-first of this month is when there is a specific budget session. We'll be looking at all the items. Council will have a chance to input on all of them, and hopefully, we can get to the point we can give clear enough to direction to the staff so they can put a final one in and we will adopt it before the end of June. Excellent, all right, put that on your list and uh, yep. we'll be uh, covering that meeting also. Um, let's move on, one of the, uh, we've had lots coming up in the last few council meetings, the uh, youth council has set up what's called a special events permit ordinance that's happening. So kind of explain what that ordinance, ordinance is about, why we need it, how the community benefits from what's a, called a special events permit ordinance. Okay. And if I have a big party, do I need one? No, I'm kidding. This, this special event thing is when uh, you invite a lot of public, not just family and friends, but public, and they impact the neighborhood, the streets, the, the city facilities, uh, and that sort of thing. In order to do that, there's an ordinance to control that. Because in some areas, it's gone pretty bad. It, it's been as bad, if not worse, than Airbnb in some areas. Mm -hmm. So also, we're trying to, we're not going to limit the people who have family and friends over for a birthday or a party or a pool parties. No, that's not the intent. The intent is when you have public invited, which are not known to the family. And also, though, gatherings on public right of ways, not just it, in private, oh, yes. it's both. No, it's on public right of way. It's on any public property, not just the right of way, any public property. So that means if you know 30 people want to get together, say at Founders Park, and they're going to have a family outing, does that mean they need to go to the city in advance and get the proper permit, or that's being all worked out, how that's all going to be? That, that's all being <laughs> worked out. We don't have all the details. There are some things like that, uh, like if they go to Founders Park or they go to PVIC at one of the picnic tables. Uh, again, it's based on what is the impact to our infrastructure. Right. If there is an impact, then there's got to be a permit so we can control the impact. So what's the timeline? How, is this go, how does this go into effect? Is, is, did you throw a goal this back to the Planning Commission or not? Where, is it in effect? The ordinance will come, no, the ordinance will come to the City Council on first reading. Okay. We'll have a public hearing 
And if there are any changes, they'll be put in. And then they'll come on the second reading. If there are changes, we may have to have another reading. But if the changes are just clarifications and not really a change in, in the operation, then on second reading, it'll be adopted and becomes effective. Okay. And a lot of communities have these. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, the uh, council heard concerns as we're talking about gatherings at public parks and things um, with what's going on at Maryland Ryan Sunset Park, which happens to be near my neighborhood. Yeah. There's been um, some concerns of vandalism, loitering after, you know, you're not supposed to be there after sunset technically. So, um, and it's above Trump National. So talk about the situation that's at hand there and sort of what are the options? What's going to happen? Well, the, the option, the, what's happening there is people are abusing the park. Uh, they're leaving trash, they're doing some vandalism and things like that. Uh, and a lot of it is at night. Uh, and then there's some question what kind of activity is going on. Uh, People would be surprised what, what kind of activities go on in places like that at night, even at City Hall, because it's accessible, it's off the main road, and it's dark. So, and everybody knows about us now. And everybody knows about it. So and what we're trying to do is temper that a bit so that it used what it was originally intended for. Mm -hmm. That's what we're doing. Okay. So, so what are the options, though, to kind of... Well, we've talked about uh, Deal with it. dealing with the parking. Uh, there was some concern about the closing the parking lot, uh, yet we have some evidence that even though it's a long walk, a lot of people park on Trump Drive and they walk through there. Uh, they, uh, we get graffiti on the tables. I don't know. It, it, right. it, it's a whole different kind of attitude. So the council is considering options as to how to address the problems of the vandalism, the loitering, the gatherings after yep. sunset, um, because it's also part of the California Coastal Commission's, you have to be, like, you couldn't, like someone was saying, like, why don't we just take all the, pic the picnic bench out? None of that's going to well, be able to you, happen. Well, you, right? you can do that. You, you can't prevent public access. You can control it, right. but you can't prevent it. So that's it. what's going to happen. And that's what control. it's all about. We're trying to find some measures, again, to get people to understand, hey, this is a nice thing. Don't you want it to be nice when you come back? Right. That's so the whole idea. In terms of law enforcement patrolling there more, will that happen? Just to people. They will sunset? be aware of it. We're not going to put specific law enforcement there because we've got a city to worry about, right. not just a small park. So uh, we're not going to put something special, but but they'll be more aware of it, and as they do their patrolling, they'll be able to monitor it better. At a council meeting recently, you took on the issue of what's going on with short-term rentals in the city. And the council had decided you voted four to one to prohibit short-term rentals, which means for people that rent their house out on, say, Airbnb, that's going to be prohibited. Talk a little bit about why you felt that was necessary, the council, to, to take this action and basically say, residents of RPV, you, can't, you, know, you cannot rent out your home 30 days or less. These short-term rentals have to stop. Well, we've had some in the community, and they've really been abusing the privilege and creating a, a, a problems in the neighborhood of all sorts. And our city was not formed to have commercial operations in a residential area, and that is a commercial operation. Right. And other someone's saying, what about me as a homeowner? I have the right to rent my house out, but not if it's having a negative impact. If, okay, let's put it this way. If, if you're going to go overseas for six months or something, and you need somebody there to watch the house. To rent it to a family with the strict, strict controls that no, this, you treat this as your home, not as a rental for parties and stuff, the ordinance is going to have some leeway to, to permit that kind of thing. It'll permit a birthday party right. for the family, but not a birthday party or a wedding venue for the public. That's so, the difference. So when will it go into effect, the, um, the short-term well, rental Well, okay, situation? like any ordinance, uh, it's got to be drafted so it's legal. Uh, as soon as the attorney gets that, there'll be a hearing. Uh, the council will react to any changes. When the changes are incorporated, then there'll be a hearing for the first reading. 
And uh, by the way, at these hearings, the public is going to be notified and welcome to come because we want their input. We don't know everything, contrary mm -hmm. to what people think. And so we will be doing that. And there will be a first reading of the final format. And then at the next meeting will be a final reading, and that's when it takes place. We're looking at that to happen rather quickly. We want to, as, as uh, Councilman Mizzich says, we want to really nip this in the bud before it gets almost unmanageable, like it has in other cities. Well, um, you've just got a lot on your plate. One last thing, because we are actually running out of time. PFAL management trapping po program is going to go back into play again. Yes. You are already working on, you know, bringing the population down in a humane and safe way. I know people that love these birds get worried, but I, I actually went out with the trapper and it's done very safely and they're oh, being yeah. transported to communities that want these birds. Yeah, uh, we're, we're trapping them after the mating season. So that will start in the summer. Uh, yes, uh, mid to late summer is when that starts and we're gonna do that then. Um, as you know, and at the council, I said, gee, why not get it before the mating season so you cut the population down? Well, people said, well, you know, that's inhumane for the female. They, well, you don't have to trap all the males. Right. I think and I got news for you. Some of the males that have more than one female will not be sad. There you go. Well, I think they're doing it. They, I think in the big picture last year, they, they, it was effective. They yes, had, it was. You got, I think, 150 birds that that's were about relocated. The number, yeah. Residents can stay tuned to that, and they're looking for people that might want to trap in their, in their yes. backyard. Yes. And they can contact the city if they're yes. interested. It's contact on, the all city. on the website. Yep. Well, we, I had more things to talk about. Any last final mayor's announcements before we have to wrap it up? I think we've kind of gone over. Well, don't forget the city's 4th of July. Coming up. Celebration. Yep. Coming up. Uh, that's really got to go forward as great as it has been. and It's going to go on again. Uh, the other thing that... Keep your eye on a city council meeting. Uh, the big con conglomerates get all the advertising. And I think we should really honor and, and respect the small businessman who's the backbone and doesn't get that. So I've been honoring them with a... And businesswomen. Businesswomen. Businesses. Okay, there you go. All, all kinds of business. <laughs> well, uh, the, the, business first, the first one was uh, Point Vicente Animal Hospital. Right. Okay, so that was a woman. I saw that was great. Yeah. She's amazing. Uh, and we're not ignoring the Western Avenue area because th this coming regular council meeting will be honoring someone there. Okay. And so we're trying to get the people to understand that our community is not just these big box stores and that sort of thing. There's a lot of small entrepreneurs and most of them are local people and a lot of them were born in the area. So shop local. So, you know, support them because they do one thing that the big box stores don't do that well, and that provides service. So this is something you've started to honor these yes. businesses. Give them a certificate of recognizing, recognizing their contribution to the community. Excellent. I like that. And I'm looking forward to seeing you on the 4th of July, but we'll be back here in June talking about yes. what happened and, and we'll remind the residents again. Again, for the 4th of go. July, yes. Super. All right. Well, great to always have you here. Mayor Dida, thanks for all you're doing and taking time out to come here and uh, update the residents, and uh, we'll see you out in the community, because you're everywhere. It, it's, <laughs> it's my pleasure, and I enjoy meeting with you and doing these things because it gives me an opportunity to let the people know a bit more about the background of what's going on. And, of on. course, they can tune into RPV TV and watch the entire council yes. meetings so they can see all of these issues as you, you, you go through all of them. I'd like to mention one thing about that. People look at that and they think they got to watch the entire, but if you go down the agenda and you pick the thing you're interested in, click on it, the video goes right to that section so you get to this right. thing That's, you're interested in. You watch in. it online that way. You're absolutely right. Watch it online and watch out for the newsletter. It's okay. going to have a lot of that stuff in it too with a link to the website so you can get more information. It's going to be a new newsletter coming out. All this is on our website, too, on yep. the city's website. Super. All right, with that, we're going to wrap it up here at this, on this edition of RPV City Talk with Mayor Ken Dida. I'm Liz Brown Swanson. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks for joining us.